I think Xi Jinping is China's most powerful leader for many decades since Deng Xiaoping, and there's three reasons for that. One is his princeling heritage. His father was a famous revolutionary. He gets inherits a certain amount of legitimacy. He's given a certain amount of uh, latitude for that. Two is he's turned out to be one of the most politically capable leaders on the planet. There's a lot of factors in that. One is that he's very charismatic. He's very good at winning support. Two is that he's been incredibly patient. He's convinced a whole spectrum of the Chinese elite that he's not going to be a threat to their power until he got there and showed a different tune. Uh, and third is he's ruthless. He's politically willing to destroy enemies, to create examples of people who may get in his way, um, to give the impression of absolute authority. You know, who would dare stand in the way of one of his priorities when um, he's been wielding this corruption campaign so ruthlessly and sending so many officials to jail? This is perhaps the biggest variable that China faces. To what extent and how will Xi Jinping pursue this economic reform agenda, which he has long um, touted and which was enshrined in the communique following the third plenum in November last year? So they have the headline document. They have cover for substantial economic reforms. Actually getting them done is a different story. It's now seven months after the plenum. There's not yet been a lot of convincing action on the economic reform front. I expect there will be much more, but uh, it's already overdue. We have to wait for evidence. And we've also got to accept that every bit of economic reform involves a reduction in political power. And this is from a guy who's shown that he values political control over all else. So it's a simple equation. Will he be more likely to be in power in 2022 if he reforms the economy now or if he doesn't? Um, it's a very finely balanced, balanced calculation. We've got to watch this space. Well, China's decision to advance uh, in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, to pick fights with Philippines, Vietnam and Japan simultaneously and also uh, in the background heighten its differences with the United States and create nervousness all throughout the Asia Pacific region is a massive opportunity for India. India becomes potentially a great balancing force for China. Every country in the region with only a couple of minor exceptions has an interest now in drawing closer to, to India, in inviting Indian naval boats to Vietnam, the Philippines, to strengthen uh, security communication, intelligence sharing throughout the region. I think this is India's moment to actually be a serious power in the East Asia region because the world's opening the door for it to do that. Well, just when China does look, you know, it is a powerful country, but once for anybody who's tempted to think it's all powerful and it's inexorably rising, they only have to look back to the saga of Bo Chi Lai, you know, the, the great contender who built his fiefdom in Chongqing City, another princeling, uh, who looked like he was going to be a real challenger for power, uh, but came a cropper in a series of extraordinary accidents and conspiracies in Chung, Chongqing, which exposed Chinese politics to be ruthless as it ever was. You know, nobody trusts, there's very little trust within that system. It's very brittle. Leaders are insecure. Uh, it explains why they are so careful to accumulate power, because if you're not accumulating it, you're losing it. So I think the Borsilai saga, which I've discussed in my book, really just reveals how brittle the system is.